Ephesians, the fourth chapter. Powerful idea that Paul gave us to explain to us why Christianity is superior to all world religions. Now, the fourth chapter is a pretty powerful chapter in itself. And I'm just going to look at verses 4, 5, and 6, and 7 because, or uh, through 6, because he lays out seven doctrines that separate Christianity from all world religions. Now, there are a lot of things that separate us, but he laid out seven doctrines. Paul listed seven key doctrines of Christianity in our lesson text, Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. These seven doctrines separate Christianity from all the world religions. These seven doctrines is also what makes the Christian church important to every community of the world. I can't do anything about the fact that churches don't teach the Word of God. I, I can't do anything. The Christian churches, if they don't teach it, they don't teach it. But I can do something about ours. <laughs> and I'm telling you that these seven doctrines are the most seven, these are the seven doctrines that separate our our faith from everybody else's. And these seven doctrines I'm going to introduce. I'm going to come back later, and I'm going to do a study on these seven doctrines. I'm going to introduce them to you tonight, uh, today in the short time I have just as an introduction. We always look for markers in the Greek language, and so this one's easy. It's the word one. Watch this now. Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. Watch the seven things he says. There is one body. There is one spirit. That's a capital S, Holy Spirit. Just also as you were called into one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and here's my final one. One God and Kai, that's an adjunctive Kai, they're connected. One God and Father. And I'm going to save this last part. Do I can come back and I can really do a study with you, but listen to this last part. That's a study in itself. Watch this, what he says. He says, let me find my place again. I lost it. The God and Father, watch this. Watch the word all. Of all who is over all, and through all, and in all. Now, I, I don't have time to even deal with that, because that's another marker, the word all, just like the word one, one. Now we got all, and that's, I, I can't do them both, don't have time, but I'm telling you, they're both dynamite. Because over here is the one that's exclusive and over here is inclusive. All. So let's look at the seven things that Paul lists, the seven doctrines that Paul lists, and I'm going to introduce them. He introduces them on ideas, which are doctrines. And I'll come back, and one day I'll come back before long, and I'm going to look at these seven doctrines. Now, we, we have studied these seven doctrines a lot. But once we have it going, we'll come back and look at it. Look at the first doctrine, one body. Now, see the word one in the Greek language, that's heis, H-E-I-S, H-E-I-S. It's the word one is heis. It's, it's important that you see that. Now, does one mean one? Yeah, it means one. <laughs> it means one, but it's important that you understand this is the word heis, and, and notice it's going to be used contextually as a nominative singular neuter. One body, the word body is soma. That's a long O. That's a long O. You put a mark above that O, that means a long O. That's an omega. So that's a soma is a body. Now the word body can be used in many ways, but he's referring to the church, the Christian church. And, and he's referring to the universal church. Now the local church should be an image of the universal church. That's what the local church should be. It should be a mirror 
of the universal. Now, in our first study, which I didn't get to, I left it to get to this, the universal church, the universal church, there's only one church. That one church consists of one body, one spirit, one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father. Universal church. But here's about the universal church. The reflection of the universal church everywhere in the world, church of Jesus Christ is the same everywhere, should be. It was designed to be. There's only one church, and it, it composes of these ones doctrinally. But the, the unique thing about Christianity, the unique thing about Christianity, except it's a sense of science or anything, is the universal body is made up of living believers and dead believers, church-age believers. When, when the, moment, the moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you become a member of the universal church of Christ. There's only one. I call it universal. One church. Now, when a believer dies, he, go, he goes to be with the Lord in heaven. That's one part of the universal church. The rest of us live on earth. We're part of the universal church. We're a local reflection. If you were in heaven, the church that sits in heaven would reflect, you see, the church in heaven. But it would be difficult to focus on it because Jesus Christ is the focus. Down here on earth, the church is a reflection of the thing that the heavenly church is reflected of, which is the person of person and work of Jesus Christ. You understand that? Okay. Now, in our first lesson of study, what was important, that when you're part of the one universal church, here's what makes us unique. When Jesus Christ comes back, and every time we take part in the Eucharist, we proclaim his death until he comes, right? What makes us unique in the church, the way, reason Christianity, is that the moment Christ comes, we call it the rapture, those members of the church that are with Christ now will come with him in the air, and we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them, and the universal church will be one again. Nobody. I mean, if anybody wants to duplicate something, nobody can touch that one. <laughs> you understand? Know that's, the, that's the one church. That's the one universal church. Now, when the writer, and, and certainly we know that Paul believes that, when he says one body, he's talking to, about, the, well, let's, let's take a look at this. Let me, let me show you. Let's go to Ephesians. Since we're there, let's go to the fifth chapter and look at verse 23. He, he, he's talking about Christ in the church, and he's using marriage as an example. In verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, right, as Christ is also the head of the church. Now watch this. He's the head of the church. Christ is the head of the church. He himself is the savior of the what? Body. There's only one body, and there's only one savior. One body and one savior. One baby, one... Uh, <laughs> I said, one baby. <laughs> There's only one baby and one body. Uh, so that's important. Now, in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, it says that at the point of salvation, the Holy Spirit baptizes us into union with Christ. See? And that you can never grow. If you die, you're in union with him in heaven. If you're on earth, you're in union with him on earth. Because ba the Holy Spirit baptizes you into the body of Christ. I give you other scriptures. I'm just doing an introduction with you. If you want to get a look how every person fits in it, then you read 1 Corinthians 12, uh, 12, 12 through 27. I'll come back later and do a doctrine. I've, I laid out a lot of scriptures for you. The second one is that there's one spirit, the pneuma, it's nominative, singular, neuter, as used in our text. Galatians, the third chapter, 2 and 3 says, how did you receive the Holy Spirit? Everybody's got a wonderful opinion, but it ought to be scriptural. <laughs> it's got to be scriptural. Oh, did you receive it because you did something, or did you receive it by faith? Well, you received it by faith, or you didn't get it. It's a gift. The, receiving the Holy Spirit is one of the eight works of the Holy Spirit at salvation. 
And so Galatians, the third chapter, makes this clear. And he said, well, listen, if that's so, then why are you making a big deal out of works and not out of the ministry of the Holy Spirit? Because he, he came inside you. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. What? Don't you know that your bodies become the temple of God? Because your body was purchased at the cross of Jesus Christ so the Holy Spirit could be, your body could be cleansed and he could take up residence inside you because his residence has to remain until well, John 14, 16 says forever. Now, that's a long time, isn't it? I don't know how long forever is for you, but you use it incorrectly. The guy said to me the other day, I think I've been married forever. Now, I know what he meant. And I said, well, you know, biblically, you're right. <laughs> But I know he didn't mean it that way when he said that. He went like, yeah. Of course, I, I probably read, I shouldn't have been reading that much into it. I should just take him at his word. Romans 8, chapter, verse 11. Listen about this. The power that raised Jesus from the dead is the Holy Spirit who lives inside your body. You know what the word Listen, the word you ought to walk away with today is not Holy Spirit. The word you ought to walk away with today is power. Say power. Power. There should be no weak Christians. We're the center of the power of God. We are the center of the power of God. I mean, we're better than Alabama Power. I mean, who do you call when your lights go off? Yeah. We are the power center. We are the center in this world. Christianity is the center of the power of God. We're the center. The church is the center. You know, you want to get your battery charged, you ought to go to what? Church. But make sure you got a church that's got a place where you can plug it in. You can plug it in here. Romans 8, chapter, verse 23. He talks about the first fruit of the Holy Spirit. The first fruit of the Holy Spirit. The first fruit of the Holy Spirit. Oh, you need to read that. You know when you you know where that you got the first fruit when you got saved. And you probably didn't even know you had the first fruit. God said you got it. You got the first fruit of the Spirit. And you know what? Listen. Here's what he means. Romans 5.5. 5. The moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, the moment you believe the Holy Spirit poured out the love of God, poured out the love of God and filled up your hungry soul with the love of God. There should be no, no, no Christian should be lacking in the love of God because God poured out his love in our hearts by the presence of the Holy Spirit. And one of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5.22 is that love. You always have it. The Holy Spirit will see that you always have sufficient love for your need for your time. It won't be not this artificial gobbledygook love. It's the real deal. Not this Valentine's candy stuff. This is the real deal. So I, I gave you other passages that would be well worth your read. I'm just trying to go through to give you an introduction. Here's the one. One hope, elpis, nominative singular feminine, of the calling. One hope of the calling. Now let me tell you, both those words are dynamite. We could spend a lot of time on the one hope, but there's an attachment to it. And so I don't want to spend my time on the word hope. I want to spend my time on the calling. Because it's one hope of the calling. The hope that you that is designed to work with the calling. So I want to focus on the idea of the calling with the definite article. You know that, that TES is a definite article of places. 
in Romans, the first chapter, verse 1, it says, it was by the love of God, it was through the love of God, through the love of God that brought his son to burden, to put all the burden of your sin on so that you could be cleansed by faith through grace. Watch this now. Watch this now. So that you could be called no longer a sinner, but a saint. <laughs> I'll tell you, one year, I thought I wanted to minister to my family, and they were tired of hearing me. I went home that summer, told everybody how to be saved and why they should do it today. And this probably over-dramatized my whole thing a little bit. So I thought I would send them all a Christmas card. And I explained there why they were sinners and how they could become saints. And I signed my name, Saint Ron Adama. I don't know if you've ever gotten Christmas cards after the fact. I got belated Christmas cards almost up to Easter. <laughs> so I don't recommend that, but it is true. We are saints. Not because you deserve it, not because you earned it, because you're no longer a sinner. In the eyes of God, you're no longer a sinner because you've been redeemed. You've been, you have been removed from the slave market of sin sinner and transferred into the kingdom of the beloved son. You're no longer a sinner. You may sin, but you're not a sinner. You're a saint who sins. There's a world of difference. The difference is sinner hasn't been saved. Scripturally. I know you, you talk funny, but that, look. Talk scriptural. See, you've been redeemed. Once you're redeemed, you're cleansed. You're cleansed from being a sinner. You don't have to be a You don't have to even sin if you'd walk in the spirit all the time, but mm, that's a tough road, isn't it? I mean, that's a tough one. You know, if you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. But that's tough. It's Listen, I'm telling you, I understand how tough that is. But the fact that I can walk in the power of the Holy Spirit makes me a saint. Don't make me a sinner. He can't be in the presence of it. You understand? He cleansed my body. My body was a sinful. sinful because the headquarters directed it that way. <laughs> I'm not playing poker with any of you today, I can tell you that. You're pay, playing poker with me. One hope, one hope. In, in, in Romans 8, chapter verse 30, verse 29, verse 29 and 30, they're dynamite. In the 11th chapter, verse 29, you should read this. It says, his calling is, in, is irrevocable. His calling is irrevocable. Do you hear that? His calling is irrevocable. We know what he's talking about. He's not talking about call to the ministry. He's call, talking about call the call to salvation, the invitation to come in. Oh, well, I suppose I have to clean up. Mm -mm. No, you come by faith, just like you are. The work's already been done. We'll do the cleaning. <laughs> uh, we'll do the cleaning. There's no pre-cleaning here. The blood of Christ to do the cleaning, or there won't be no cleaning. He will cleanse you from your sins. Come on now. See, Ro Romans 8, cha chapter 29, conformed to the likeness of his, uh, of his holy son. And then he says, what? He says, predestined, called, justified, glorified. Oh, geez, that's so good. 
In Ephesians 1.18, we, we, we use this a lot in teaching a lot of different subjects. It talks about the eyes of your heart enlightened to know and understand experientially the hope of your calling. Does it again. There ought to come a point. Now, you got the hope of your calling, but when your eyes can understand it and your heart can sense it and your life can reflect it, woo, that's what Paul's talking about in Ephesians 1. Second Thessalonians 1, 11 and 12, well worth your read. Here's the fourth thing, one Lord, one Lord. Elizabeth meets Mary in Luke 1, 43. The babies jump inside the wombs. And she declares, the mother, I have just met the mother of my Lord with a capital L. There's a, there, there is a ministry uh, of the, the Holy Spirit speaking to a mother bearing a child, to another bear, mother bearing a child that is lights out of, in conversation. That's a light out conversation. And, and she declares Mary to be the mother of her Lord. We got. Talk about God being in charge. Talk about pregnancy. God in charge. That's pretty powerful stuff right there. One Lord. In, the, in Luke, the second chapter, verse 11, one of the wonderful Christmas stories is the angel comes to the shepherds, right? The shepherds, the temple shepherds. What a wonderful story that is. And declare that the child that's just been born is the Savior called Christ the Lord. Of course, the book of Acts in the second chapter, 23, 24, into 34 tells you the same. The whole book of Acts is about that. You know what makes him Lord? Well, his identity. But you know what? When people began to identify him that way, when it changed from rabbi to Lord. You know, he was the rabbi, the rabbi, the rabbi, my rabbi, my rabbi, my rabbi. Then all of a sudden there was no more, no more talk about the rabbi. You know what he's talked about? The Lord, the Lord, the Lord. You know what? You know what that mark of deportation in their minds occurred? His resurrection. <laughs> oh, they don't talk about him, no rabbi. They don't talk about him, no rabbi. He is their Lord, Savior, God Almighty. <laughs> they don't talk about him, no rabbi, rabbi Jesus. He's the Lord Jesus Christ been raised from the dead. And, and listen, and his resurrection has been witnessed by over 500 people at the time. <laughs> of course, one faith, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, he would say, see, all of these things are dealing with your package of salvation. Every, every person, every person is in the one body. One spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, 4, by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself as a gift of God, not of works. Romans 1, 16 and 17 uh, tell you the same thing. Uh, Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. The faith system. We, we, at, the, at the point of salvation, we have faith and you know what? The faith is in the gospel, and from that point on, the faith of the gospel begins to move into specific doctrines of new covenant doctrines, and we're now into a system of faith. And the system of faith activates grace. Under the new covenant, faith activates grace. Faith must have a working object. The working object produces under a divine scheme. That working object Whatever the Bible declares it to be, the Word of God will declare what it is. It's done because God is able to do what He promised, Romans 4.21. God is able to do what He promised. God is able to do what He's promised. When you put your faith in that working object of categorical Bible doctrine in the Christian life, God has obligated Himself to you to do it. Think about that, Dale. Who holds Him accountable? His own character. You know who should hold you accountable? 
It shouldn't take God to hold you accountable. You know who should hold you accountable? You, because you care for God that much. You should hold yourself accountable because you love God. You love God more than anything in this whole wide world. You should hold yourself accountable because you love him. You, your desire is to please him and you love him more than your life itself. You should achieve that. You can't achieve it without spiritual growth maturity. You've got to stick your head in the word of God. One faith, one baptism. One bab he's not talking water, he's talking Holy Spirit. One baptism. Matthew, the third chapter, verse 11. John says, I come baptizing water. But he, the Messiah, when he comes, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Jesus never baptized anybody with water to make sure that nobody made a mistake about that. And he baptized everybody at Pentecost with the Holy Spirit. Jesus baptized them, and after that, the Holy Spirit baptizes. People get so much craziness out of that. This is a simple procedure. And he, he was careful not to baptize anybody in water like John. John baptized in water to identify who Christ was. You need to read John the first chapter. This one baptism, not water. This is the Holy Spirit. After Jesus baptized at, at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit starts baptizing. You're baptized by the Holy Spirit. Jesus don't baptize you in the Holy Spirit. He did that at Pentecost to show you it's in. That's the fulfillment of Matthew. I, there's scripture here for you to look at. I, I don't have time today to read all these scriptures. I put them all down so sometime you would have time. Right? Like Acts 2.33 and such. But 1 Corinthians 12.13 the Holy Spirit baptizes you at the point of salvation. He baptizes you into Christ. That's positional truth. You know why that's important? Listen to me why that's important. The Holy Spirit, at the point of salvation, one of the eight works of the Holy Spirit is to baptize you into union with Christ. Where is he? He's in heaven, seated at the right hand of God the Father. In what? All authority. You're connected with all the authority in heaven and earth. Because he baptized you into Christ. Everything that Christ is, you become on earth. He, he's a son, you're a son. He, eh, you know the drill. One baptism. I gave you scripture. Look, there, look. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. He baptized you into union with Christ. Galatians, the third chapter, 27. Pay attention. He baptizes you in the church. See, people don't read the Bible. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, the Holy Spirit, the point of salvation, baptizes you into union with Christ. A pos that's positional truth. Everything he is, you become in the family of God. He's royalty, you're royalty. But in Galatians 3, 27, it says the Holy Spirit also baptizes you into the body of Christ. That universal church. You know when you become a member of the church? It's not when you walk an aisle. It's when you got saved. And the Holy Spirit baptized you at the time he baptized you into Christ, he baptized you into the body of Christ. You need to read Galatians 3.27. It's just, it's clear. I'm not making anything up. I put it on your paper. And finally, one God and Father. Notice the heist again. We got theos, no definite article. You got theos, chi, and adjunctive with the Father. This takes you, the, what he's talking about is Romans 8, 14 through 17, where God is your father, your Abba Pater, your Abba Father. Notice, he doesn't say that here. What he says here is that he's one God and Father. And he put no definite articles with it, which is talking about the function. He functions this way. If he'd have put a definite article, we'd have talked about his essence and that. Now he's talking about the function of him in your life. We sang that song, the first song we sang today, told the story. One doctrine, Romans 8, chapter 14 through 17, brings it down into a clearer understanding that not only is he your father, he's your Abba, he's your daddy. Like, you know what that means? More than somebody who just goes out and earns a living for you. Well, I pay the bills. Now, this is a guy that goes... Goes to ball games. 
He cheers his son on or his daughter on. There about his schoolwork, not from a, a demanding point, but an Abba father, one who cares, one who's supportive, one who wants to listen to his child. He hasn't got so many distractions from the world that he can't listen to his child who comes and said, hey, Dad, you got a minute? I need to talk. And Dad puts everything aside. I told my kids, I put my office in my home because I want to be close to my home. I want to be off in some kind of office. I want to be home. I want to be part of the action. I want to smell food cooking when Mama was in the kitchen. Dirty diapers and all that stuff. Well, when I did it, I discovered that my children didn't feel like they had access. And so I had to go back and call a fam. We had family conferences in our home. We had, I, I just had to have conferences. Otherwise, nobody got a chance to talk. So if I call a family conference, it, everybody could, could say, Dad, it's my turn. And I, I knew the polite, the polite way was to be quiet without them saying that. It's my turn to talk. And they said, we don't have access to you. You're home all the time, but we don't have access. We'd like access. When we want access, how do we get it? You know, do we have to go through mother and go, write out a form? <laughs> You know, they're in the fourth grade or something. <clears throat> and I thought about it. I said, well, let, let me think. Go around the room and let's hear about it. And of course, they all piled on me. That's, that's called a conference. Oh, Dad's going to let me have a whack at him. Okay, Dad, here's a whack. And that's okay. That's what I call the conference. And so I said, look, I'm going to give you what I believe God gives me. You have access to me any time of the day you want it. That's, isn't that the truth? My, I Not one time have I had anybody interrupt my call to the throne that said, well, look, he's in a conference right now, Ron. He, <laughs> can you get back at three? Have you? I never have had that. I may have hung up on him, but he never hung up on me. Not one time. And I thought, well, if I'm going to reflect the father in this home, that I ought to reflect it the way it's reflected to me. And so I set that present. And you know what? Don't have any regrets about that deal. I have none. Because you know what? It put more responsibility on them to make sure that if they disrupted me, that it would be important enough to have something done with it. And I found that to be really interesting because I didn't ask that. I didn't say, okay, now look, here are the rules. <laughs> you know, you have to really, because God didn't do any of that. God didn't say, well, no, you need to be really, it's not something petty, is it, Ron? I mean, he doesn't do that. He goes, like, if it's petty, come on. I'll, I'll have talk with you. You do know God treats you that way, don't you? You know why? Listen to me. This is what I believe, because he's your daddy, not because he's your father. It's because He's not the father. He's the daddy. This is the daddy part that wants to be involved in the lives, care about him. The children should know you really care about them. Now I feel that way about my grandchildren. I have to remind them, listen, you have access to me any time you want access. I don't care what time of day. I don't care what it is. If you want access to me, if you want to call me, listen, they call me for prayer all times of the day. My grandchildren. And I love that. I love that about that. All right. Listen. At the moment of grace, let me conclude. At the moment of grace salvation, every believer receives these seven things. It is his or her responsibility to learn them doctrinally. And as a church, we will teach them to you by truth in the coming days. Okay, let's pray. Let's stand. i give you a chance to be on your feet. Uh, oh, Rick, let, let's do this. Rick, let's do our pledge, and then you close us in a word of prayer, if you would. 
pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty, justice for all. Close us in prayer, Rick. setting the example for all the rest of us in our leadership position. Thank you for thank you for part of your church. Thank you for giving us a way of life, not a religion. Mm. I salute you for all that you have done for us in grace. I ask you to protect us as we go this week and continue to teach us and bring us back. Amen.